All right, everyone. Thanks for another Stoa Nova Conversations um, occasional episode chat, uh, live chat. Uh, my name is Massimo Pilucci. I am a professor of philosophy at City College of New York, um, and I have an ongoing interest uh, in the theory and practice of Stoicism, which is why we're doing these things. Uh, before I introduce today's topic and guest, uh, let me remind you, uh, or tell you for the first time if you don't know, that the next episode of the Stone Over Conversations will take place on Monday, June 29th. Uh, right now it's, it's set at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, the topic will be how to think like a Roman emperor, and my guest accordingly will be the author of that book, uh, Don Robertson, who is, as you probably know, one of the leaders of the modern stoicism uh, movement. If you want to register for that event, go to meetup.com and look for the Stoa Nova, and uh, you'll find it. Now, today's topic is to hell with feelings, and my guest is Gregory Lopez. Greg is the founder and facilitator of the New York City Stoics Meetup, and co-founder and board member of the Stoic Fellowship. He's also on the team for Modern Stoicism and co-facilitates Stoic Camp New York with yours truly. In addition, he's the lead editor of forexamine.com and editor-in-chief of the Examine Research Digest. He co-authored a handbook for new Stoics with myself. Greg, welcome. Thank you for having me. So, yeah, so let's, uh, what, what is this thing about, uh, let's do away with feelings? What, 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 what do you mean? Well, the topic kind of came up while I was kind of learning or getting deeply into Epictetus's training program of the three disciplines. And I started to notice an incongruence between um, how a lot of people get to Stoicism and how Stoicism is actually marketed, if you want to say that, in the modern world. And the ultimate goal of Epictetus's version of Stoicism, as well as Stoicism more generally. Um, and it, this kind of incongruence sunk in more when in New York City Stoics, we read Margaret Graver's wonderful book, um, Stoicism and Emotion. And I kept on saying in that group when we were going over the book, like, the Stoics really just don't care about your feelings. They don't care how you feel. That's not the goal of Stoicism. And so I kind of wanted to cover that since this is a, this is a problem for a few reasons. Uh, a lot of people come to Stoicism or are interested in Stoicism because they're in some kind of psychic pain. Um, they have anxiety. They have depression, things like that. Perhaps not clinical, hopefully not clinical, so that they're going to a licensed professional for those kinds of things. But um, af to borrow from Freud, after they got to normal levels of human misery, then perhaps philosophies <laughs> of life can be better uh, suited for them. And so they come to Stoicism. But the thing is, Stoicism is not about making you feel better. Um, and so hence the title of today's talk. And so I want to kind of give just a little bit of evidence for this before we use this as a platform for jumping off into what Stoicism actually means, Stoics actually mean by emotion. So um, it's not like in the ancient Stoic literature, there's no mention of feeling better whatsoever. So I did a quick Greek search before coming on, looking through Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus for um, the adjective of um, the Greek word ataraxia, which is kind of peace of mind. Um, and it's definitely mentioned, it's mentioned six times in Marcus Aurelius and about 38 times in Epictetus's writings. Um, and occasionally it's just in passing, but sometimes it's actually like Epictetus is promoting it. He says like, this is a useful thing to have peace of mind. But the thing is, this is a very minor component of what he's saying his goal is and the goal of Stoic training is. And so when you take a look and see what the, um, what the point of uh, the first discipline, especially of Epictetus, is it's more things come up like um, being free from impediment or never failing to get what you want or falling into misfortune. It's more that kind of stuff rather than um, feeling good. So um, I'm going to actually, I think I may be having a little bit of audio troubles. So I'm going to try to handle that. Um, I can hear you well, but... Oh, okay, because I actually hear some background noise that maybe one of us mm. or not that's kind of popping through. I just turned off my air conditioner, but it may not have been me. But anyway, I'll continue. <laughs> so um, so um, kind of the point of Epictetus's first discipline is that of kind of 
being free from hindrance. So I'm going to read a couple of portions from Epictetus that kind of bring this point home a little bit. Um, the first one is the famous uh, part from Enchiridion 1.3, um, where he's talking about um, the dichotomy of control, which is perhaps the most famous part of Stoicism. So he says, remember then that if you regard um, uh, things as that are not your own as your own, you'll have cause to lament, you'll have a troubled mind. So there's the troubled mind, the kind of disturbance. And you'll right. find fault with both uh, gods and human beings. But if you regard only that which is your own as being your own, and that which isn't your own as not being your own, as is indeed the case, no one will ever be able to coerce you. So here's the action component. No one will hinder you. Again, action. You'll find fault with no one. Now we're bringing in social relations. You'll accuse no one. You'll do nothing whatever against your will and you'll have no enemy and no one will ever harm you because uh, no harm can affect you. So that's one example of Epictetus kind of hammering home more of the freedom from hindrance rather than feeling better. Um, and another example comes from Discourses 3.2 where he's discussing the first discipline, the discipline of desire. And he says, of the three disciplines, the most important and most urgent one is that concerned with the passions, which is the discipline of desire, the first discipline that Stoics train in. For these arise in no other way than uh, through our being frustrated in our desires and falling into what we want to avoid. This is what brings about disturbances. So again, he does mention mental disturbances, feelings, um, confusions, misfortunes, and calamities, and cause sorrow, lamentation, again, some affect there, and envy, making people envious and jealous with the result that we become incapable of listening to reason. And that is the take home here that actually the Stoics don't really care about how you feel. The training of trying to decrease passions is not because it feels better. And you can kind of think of this because passions aren't just things with negative affect in Stoicism. They also say things like desiring money, desiring wealth, desiring sex and things like that. Having strong desires for these things are something to be eliminated, even though they are pleasant. And so the take home here is not that stoic training is about making you feel better. It's to make you a more reasonable human being. And also uh, note that um, it's about uh, reducing envy and making people envious and jealous and getting people to conflict. So it's also in order to make people more pro-social. So these passions, they don't want to reduce them to make you feel better, to hell with feelings in a sense. They're doing it in right. order for you to be able to uh, actually be a more fulfilled and full human being. And human beings are people who are rational and pro-social. And so passions get in the way of that. But in order to kind of spell that out, this is a good jumping off point for kind of going through exactly how the Stoics conceived of passions. So I'll hand it back over to you at that point. Well, so so for what you're saying, uh, uh, what, what do you think then of the, you know, the standard stereotype of the Stoics as uh, you know, suppressing their emotions, going through life with a stiff upper lip and all that sort of stuff. Your response is, no, that's missing the point, right? Yes, that's missing the point for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's not to feel nothing. Um, so Margaret Graver also gave a great, gave the, ta uh, the preliminary, preliminary talk at Stoicon 2018, and she kind of went over three different versions of being, having like um, free from passions or a peaceful mind. She gave the Cynic's version, the um, Epicurean version, and the Stoic version. And the Stoic version has nothing to do with uh, kind of keeping a stiff upper lip. That's kind of more the Cynic version. Cynicism <laughs> is made to kind of make you hard and tough because they think the natural state of humans is to be tougher. Um, whereas Stoicism isn't really like that. And the Stoic um, descriptions of the ideal sage constantly talk about how the sage feels. And in addition to that, there are also a couple of things that even the sage would quote unquote feel. And so it's very useful to separate what the Stoics mean by emotion and feelings, because um, you can't turn off certain things for that are, we sometimes call feeling and sometimes called emotion. And we have to be very careful about what we're pointing to when we say this is an emotion and this is a feeling. So yeah, I would say that that uh, version of a small S stoicism is a bit off. Well, we'll talk about the sage in a minute. And by the way, let me remind people who are uh, watching, listening, that uh, at some point uh, in this conversation, which is going to last about an hour, we will open up for Q&A. So if you have questions, don't put them into the uh, chat. Just you know, raise your virtual hand uh, in, in Zoom, and then I'll call on you. But um, Greg, before we uh, go to get to the stage, I want to talk a little bit with you about how Diogenes Laertius 
talks about stoic emotions because, of course, as you know, Diogenes is one of the major sources that we have for the entire stoic system, the other one being book three of uh, the Finibus by Cicero. And, and then there is a scatter of other things, but as a, as a sort of a over, overarching presentation of the system, uh, these, these two are the big ones. So Diogenes says something interesting here uh, about the stoic treatment of emotions. He says, they hold the emotions to be judgments as is stated by Chrysippus in his treatise on the passions. Avarice being a supposition that money is a good, while the case is similar with drunkenness and profligacy and all the other emotions. Fear is an expectation of evil. Desire or craving is irrational appetency. Pleasure is an irrational elation at the accruing of what seems to be choice worthy. So what do they mean by emotions are forms of judgment? So what they're saying in modern philosophical terms is that emotions have what are called propositional content in them. Um, these are things that can be, so propositions in modern um, logic and modern philosophy are the things that can be true or false. Um, it's proper to say a proposition is true or false, and that's what kind of makes a proposition. Whereas things like sentences can express propositions, but um, you could say um, the same proposition in two different languages, and you're saying two different sentences essentially, but it's expressing the same proposition. So what they're mm -hmm. saying here is that emotions have an underlying judgment. And what kind of judgment is that? It is a value judgment. What is actually good and what is actually bad or evil? Um, so that's kind of the underlying structure of how the Stoics view emotions. We get these initial um, presentations to us that have propositional content, like this is good or this is bad. And if we nod yes in agreement or shake our head no in disagreement or withhold judgment, that can lead to the arising of a passion or not, depending on whether that value judgment of good or bad is actually true or false. Right. So then Diogenes Laertius keeps going on this and he gives other examples. It says, joy, the counterpart of pleasure, is rational elation. Caution, the counterpart of fear, rational avoidance. They, they, meaning the Stoics, make wishing the counterpart of desire or craving inasmuch as it is rational appetency. So these are the famous positive emotions, right? So passion technically indicates only the negative emotions, right? Uh, these are the positive ones. And so my question to you is, is kind of twofold, at least. First of all, um, what is it that make an, an emotion positive or negative? And second of all, um, if we want to, as you put it earlier, sort of um, uh, sell stoicism to people, shouldn't we actually put an emphasis on the positive emotions uh, here? You know, what, what kind of positive emotions would resonate today? Well, it depends on how close you want to stick to classical stoicism, because classical yeah. stoics say that all of these are only able to be experienced by the perfectly wise person or the stoic sage. So uh, non-sages cannot experience these positive uh, emotions. But yes, they are the positive emotions. And I maybe don't want to say so much positive as um, healthy, I think is probably a better yeah. term. Because remember, some things like righteous anger or uh, strong desires feel positive. They have a positive feelings. And again, the theme of today is to hell with feelings. So yeah, we're, we don't really care about how they feel, what their valence is per se. It's more that they're healthy, that these are the emotions that a perfectly well-developed human being, the sage, would feel. And yes, they do have feelings. So that valence is there. These kind of feel positive and negative. So joy does feel positive to the sage, whereas caution would feel eh, it wouldn't feel great to the sage. And the sage does feel these things. They have that kind of balance going on, but they're more healthy or unhealthy. And what makes them healthy or unhealthy is the judgment that underlies them. That judgment being a true judging value to be true, uh, truly good or truly bad. Um, and also a second thing, and why this in classical stoicism, the sa only the sage experiences these, is that it's an unswerving judgment. Mm -hmm. And that's why the right. sage will never go wrong in their value judgments. They know that only their character is what's really good or bad. Nothing else is good or bad. And the sage will never be mistaken about that. They could be mistaken about a lot of other things. They're not omniscient, but they are never mistaken about this uh, simple to understand, hard to actually um, ingrain concept that the only good and bad is our character. And so the reason why only the sage can feel these is because they'll never go um, 
awry. These things only come up from that. And so you can have somebody who is very admirable, but not quite a sage. And they go through their life like seeming to be very virtuous. But it could very well be that it's simply because they never experienced the right conditions or adversity to make them go astray. And so luck still played a, wo- a role in their apparent virtue, whereas a sage, luck can play no role in their virtue. Right. And that's why only these eupathe are uh, for the sage in classical stoicism. Yeah, I like, again, I'm going to go back to the sage in a minute uh, with another quote from Diogenes Laertius. But uh, yeah, I like your your way of putting it in terms of health versus healthy versus unhealthy emotions. That also uh, goes well with the fact that the Stoics very often used, uh, in fact, an analogy between philosophy and health and, and medicine, uh, you know, physical health. And in fact, I think I just read earlier on today, this, uh, today, uh, um, a quote from Musonius Rufus' lectures, where he says, you know, there are there is such thing as the care of the body, and then there is such thing as the care of the soul, and the two sometimes go together, and that that's why some physical exercises. Uh, for instance, of you know temperance at the table are actually good also for your soul because they improve your your temperance. So that they definitely draw this analogy between um, uh, between the the healthy and unhealthy. I also think maybe another way to put the the difference between the um, the healthy and unhealthy emotions is that the unhealthy emotions get in the way of reason. Obviously, for instance, the most obvious example being anger, which is why Seneca wrote an entire book on it, while the uh, healthy emotions are in accordance with this. Uh, you should feel, a reasonable person should feel certain the kinds of things that the sage uh, would feel, right? So does that, does that make sense? Yeah, and they are not in, the unhealthy emotions are in, not in accordance with reason because they kind of take over reason. That's right. kind of one of the main things about them, and that's what they all have in common. So the the when the passion comes up, it's it says, "Hold my beer, I got it from here," and then it justifies itself. And this could feel good. It could be righteous anger. It could be a strong desire for material things or for sex or something like that. And those kind of feel good. Yet they're both passions because they push reason to the side and say, "I got this." Um, I'm going to take it from here. And that literally makes us less human, according to the Stoics, because what is essentially human is our ability to reason and our pro-social nature. And these passions come up and uh, push reason to the side and also turn us against one another. There's a great, um, one of my favorite examples comes from Epictetus, where he kind of talks about, um, he's giving a lecture and saying that um, he's giving one of the a stoic paradox saying that only the sage can be a true friend. Um, and somebody says, I have a lot of friends. I, I can love. That's, that's bullcrap, uh, Epictetus. And he's like, well, you kind of love like, you know, puppies love. And it's like, yeah, like puppies. That's great. Because, you know, you see little puppies in their pen. They're playing with each other and they're rolling around. And oh, how adorable. How great. What friendly little puppies. But then Epictetus says, but what happens when you throw a little bit of meat between them? Um, then they start fighting. That meat is an external. And the goal of Stoicism is to make us resilient, not to feel better, but to be able to put externals to the side in order to be a better human being and better to other fellow human beings. All right. Okay. Uh, eventually, I promise we're going to get to the sage, but I'm going to open a side, uh, side discussion here because, uh, because you just let me into it. Um, as you know, we are living in uh, uncertain times, um, and I'm referring not just to the pandemic, but also to the, you know the protests um, and uh, you know the, the the police violence and all that sort of stuff. So I, every single time that I tweet something about the stoic treatment of anger, invariably this has become a kind of a law of nature. I get somebody who gets really angry and says. I have a right to be angry. I'm going to be, be pissed off because, you know, this kind of stuff is happening in the world. And how could you possibly not be angry, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I have my response to that. But what would be your response? Uh, it, it depends on the person at the end of the day. Probably, not, probably seven out of 10 times, our response would be to leave the thread. <laughs> yes, um, that's, that's actually my preferred response. But assuming that that person actually does want generally an answer. Um, that they have a right to feel angry. Yeah, they, they're perceiving something that's uh, pretty wrong with the world. The question is, is it kind of helping them to feel this way and can they do better? Um, anger is fe- fe- fed a lot of um, negative things in the world. Um, and actually one of the things, like, occasionally you and I debate this at Stoic Camp on the, on the side after a few beers and stuff, but I ultimately hold to like a medical ethical view that may be a little different from the Stoics in that I'm not sure if anything is really good or bad at the end of the day. Um, and one of the, one of the philosophers who's uh, espoused this view, Joel Marx, kind of 
uh, brings up the examples that throughout history, you can use emotions to drive people in arbitrary directions. And so feeling these strong emotions and calling things good and bad, if you look at, at like go at random and choose some kind of war speech from both sides, I bet they're gonna be calling lots of things good and bad. Um, and this kind of stirs up emotion, which actually verifies uh, the stoic um, viewpoint that um, good and bad is what causes these emotions or these passions to arise because um, that kind of creates the dividing lines and these values stir up these passions at the end of the day. But at the end of the day, I would kind of use some of uh, Seneca's arguments and saying that, you know, can't you do the same thing without necessarily getting angry? And aren't you, if you are angry and you're hating a certain group of people because of you perceive their actions as being evil, aren't you just doing the same crap to a different group? It's this movement of hating people because they're evil that is the driving force for what you don't like. And, but yet you're doing it. It's just you're hating the wrong people. And um, I would at least try that, although that's not very good rhetoric. It probably depends on their state of mind. Um, Chrysippus gives a, the suggestion that when people are in a passion to just say, like, is that really useful right now to try to appeal to their own values? And so rhetorically, I would probably appeal to one's own values in that case. Right. They're in a passion, you can't reason per se. So that's the defining thing about a passion. So right. giving reasons, that's not the time for giving reasons. No, that's right. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's typically, it's a bad idea to say to somebody who's angry just to calm down because that's just, just going to make them more angry. Um, but if you are in the middle of a, you know, if you're having a discussion where you perceive that people are actually genuinely interested, they say, look, I'm, I'm interested in the historic stuff, but I don't get this notion of, I, that the anger is not a good thing, then I think that um, that a good argument can be made along the lines of what you were saying or along the lines of what Seneca was saying. One of my favorite examples from Seneca's own anger actually is when he essentially makes fun of Aristotle uh, by presenting one of Aristotle's own examples in favor of a middle level of, of anger, the right level of anger, uh, because Aristotle says, you know, uh, soldiers in battle will, 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 will do better, will, will be more willing to fight um, if they're a little bit angry. And to which Seneca responds, well, they also will be more willing to fight if you get them a little bit drunk. But that doesn't mean that a drunken army is a good idea. It's like you know, soldiers should have other reasons for, for wanting to fight, not, not because you actually make them drunk or, or, or angry or something like that. Um, Related to this notion of the emotions is another side track, but that's, that's because I just saw something appearing and disappearing in the, in the chat. I'm not actually following the chat, but occasionally I kind of, I get a, a glimpse of it. And somebody brought up the, the, the notion of romantic love. What about it? Um, so uh, I forget if it's, uh, I forget if it's Diogenes Laertes or um, Arius Didymus kind of goes into this. So yeah, the stories don't talk a lot about romantic love and they, when they kind of do, I, it's, pretty, it's very different. And it's sometimes hard also to separate out Roman and Greek culture from right. um, the actual things like so you know, Zeno is famous for at least in the community of sages having uh, communal uh, marriages and free love and all that kind of stuff. Whereas Musonius Rufus is, uh, and, and I guess Epictetus to some degree is also famous for saying, you know, uh, sex only within marriage and all that kind of stuff. Um, and only for procreation. Yeah, yeah, that's only, right. for, only for procreation. So um, so it's hard to see whether my my guess, although it's a guess, is that um, we don't know much about how the Stoics view romantic love qua Stoicism. We only kind of see it come through that is heavily socially tainted. But at the end of the day, I think it's Arius Didymus uh, who kind of goes into it the most. And he kind of talks about, and he actually talks about love with respect to uh, men and uh, boys because it's the Greek version. Um, and right. he says that you you know, you kind of see the beauty of the soul and you see the possibility of cultivating that person. And so, ideal romantic love in that case is uh, going to kind of use sex as a uh, intermediary to kind of help make each other better people. And I guess that's as close to the stoic view as I can get from what I understand of the ancient literature. No, I, I agree. I actually, there is, there is a book that addresses that, this sort of issue, at least in part, um, and that is uh, Liz Gloin's book on Seneca and the family, where she talks about uh, all sorts of intra-family relationships, right? You know, son, father and son and, and you know, brothers and so on. And also, of course, husband and wife. And uh, what she gets out of Seneca is in fact a picture just about like the one you described uh, that, that really is not that different from what, uh, you know, Plato presents or has Socrates present, which is the, this notion that um, 
you know, if by romantic love you mean sort of infatuation and lust and all that sort of stuff, well, that actually probably does get in the way of your correct reasoning about things. And so that's probably something that you wouldn't want to indulge too much as a stoic. But if you mean a, a relationship, a mature relationship of virtue where the two people uh, help each other grow and, 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 and yes, there is also sex, which is part of the human way of doing these things, just like having food uh, communally with other people is something that, that fosters friendship, then having sex is something that fosters these, these higher relationships you might have with another human being, then that is actually something that you want to pursue um, because it does make you and the other person uh, a better human being. But, but that's not originally Stoic. That's really kind of Plato um, telling us that. And in fact, even Aristotle, I guess, wouldn't disagree when he talks about uh, uh, when he puts it in terms of friendship, you know, the, friend, the higher level of friendship is friendship of virtue, uh, which is exactly a situation where you know, the relationship is based on, on, on growth, on reciprocal growth rather than, um, than, than anything else. Okay, so now we're going to finally get back to the sage. So the Algenis Laertius, and this is, I promise, the last quote from, from him that I'm going to bring up today, maybe, says, uh, they say, the Stoics say, that the wise man is passionless because he's not prone to fall into such infirmity. But they add that in another sense, the term apathy is applied to the bad man. When that is, it means that he is callous and relentless. So Diogenes is using this word apathy here, which, or, or passionless, in two different terms and in two different ways. And he says one way is acceptable is what you're striving for, is what, uh, it, what the sage would do. But the other one is actually quite the opposite. Uh, what's going on there, you think? So so in one of the places where Epictetus describes um, the second discipline, the discipline of action, he says that um, the goal of that discipline or area of training is to not be unfeeling like a statue, but to um, fulfill one's roles to one's fellow human beings. And so that's kind of, I think, what this is getting at, is that Stoicism is ultimately not about not feeling anything and not giving a crap about other people. It is, um, and that's actually the characteristic of a bad person, somebody who's like, you know, um, somebody who's indifferent to other people's suffering. Um, so like, that's, I, that's one of the things I have against some modern takes on Stoicism is that a lot of people's understanding of Stoicism is that it makes you resilient. Um, and my question is resilient to what end? Because I don't want Stoicism to necessarily make people resilient who can be resilient about the improper things. The goal of Stoicism is to make you resilient so that you can be a better human being and be more pro-social and more rational. It's not to make you resilient when the cries of your victims don't get to you quite as much. <laughs> it's like, oh, your tears don't bother me. I'm a Stoic. Um, that, right, that's, you, that's, it, the, that's the resilience of a psychopath. Yeah. Right. And that's the second version of apatheia, which uh, Diogenes Laertes is referring to here. It's the kind of resilience of a psychopath, um, whereas the wise person is passionless in the more stoic sense of the term of not having these emotions come up that take over your reason and make you turn against other people. Yeah. Uh, now, let's get a little, if you don't mind, in uh, more, more in-depth into sort of stoic psychology. Um, uh, uh, the, the three terms that come up more, more often in, this, in these discussions and the people tend to confuse or not be clear about, uh, and that's why, for instance, Margaret Graver spends a lot of time to talking about them, are impressions, assent, and impulse. What are they and how are they related to each other? So this is the basics of Stoic psychology and how our mind works. So at the beginning, we get fantasia or impressions, um, which are a mix of sense data as well as our initial judgments about things and things that we would call feelings, like maybe some people would call them emotions. They're the stirrings of emotions. And so our brains seem to work in that we're going about the world and looking at things and we get initial value judgments about them along with recognition of what they are, app perception in modern psychological terms, things like that. And they are all bundled by our, I guess, the the lower part of our brains or the more evolutionary ancestor part of the brains. And they're bundled and presented to our ruling faculty, our hegemonicon um, or pro um, and or prohoresis. Um, people have argued about whether they mean the same thing or not. So, um, right. the, so that's an impression. Impressions are not within our control. Um, we can't necessarily um, choose how to initial, how our initial reactions go. And so sometimes like, crappy mean thoughts can come to mind and that's not your fault 
Um, also, things like feelings of depression or anxiety or panic, especially in people with uh, certain clinical disorders, that's not your fault. You can't control that, and that's not the stuff of stoic work. And those are all impressions. Um, so the only point of our psychology, which we control, is this tiny, tiny little portion. Um, and that is our, and it's called the hegemonicon, and it has the ability to say, yes, all, that impression is true, no, that impression is false, or I don't know, I'm going to withhold judgment on whether it's true or false. And all of Stoic practice can be boiled down to working with your ability to assent to impressions, um, being able to first not buy into your initial impressions about things, and then secondly, being able to analyze them a little down the road. Um, and so impressions come in two forms, according to the Stoics. There are uh, Impressions that are like about the truth or falsity of something. Like right now, I'm looking at my cam, uh, my webcam, and I could get that impression and see whether it's true or false or not. But also, um, there are things about the appropriateness of certain actions, and these are called hormetic impressions. And so, um, depending on the type of impression you get, if you assent to it, you will either believe something. Um, it will be, well, if you're not a sage, you'll technically have an opinion, which is a technical difference right. that probably is a little too deep to get into right now. But if you agree to like, it's appropriate for me to get up or it's appropriate for me to have a drink of coffee, if you assent to that impression, you'll have the action. And that, um, that um, assenting to a hormetic impression produces an impulse, in other words, an impulse to act. Um, and Impulses are a little tricky because in the ancient Stoic literature, some people say that impulses come before ascent, some say they're a type of ascent, some after. That's a technical thing that we don't necessarily need to get into. But one of the things in terms of emotions is that the literature more or less agrees that passions, these subset of emotions that take over reason and push reason to the side are a kind of impulse. And so this is another part of the substantiating the thesis of the Stoics didn't care what you feel what the uh, phenomenological feeling the, um, is that you're experiencing so much as the impulse, because it's an impulse to action and emotions are an impulse to act. Sometimes it's externally, such as anger making you want to get revenge and act according to that, but also it can be internal actions. The Stoics describe this as how the soul kind of fluttered um, in response to the impression, but we could kind of think of it nowadays in more physiological terms, such as like getting muscle tension, having um, hormones be released and so on and so forth. So impulses, um, so passions are a kind of impulse and, and uh, impulses are what drive us to action, whether that action be internal or external. So in terms of uh, bringing this to a modern, modern way of looking at things and also in terms of sort of practice, right? Um, so I, hope, I often hear people telling me uh, things like, well, I can't control my emotions. And I think that's slippery language because it depends on, you know, well, what do you mean by emotions? If you are telling me that you cannot control the physiological, a physiological reaction you have, let's say blushing, for instance, or a rush of adrenaline when you get angry or something like that, then sure, the Stoics would agree. You can't control that. There's no point even in thinking about controlling that, right? Um, However, uh, the control part, which is, a, a, unfortunately, it's a word actually I'm trying to get away from because it, it, it generates all sorts of misunderstandings usually when you talk to people about control. You know, oh, you don't control this. Uh, but the control part, is, such as it is, comes in the, the movement from the um, part of the emotion that is inevitable, that it's a physiological reaction, and the part that actually has a kind of component and the cognitive component is the part that then actually brings you to action. So in other words, right? So in other words, in practical terms, what I'm supposed to do as a stoic practitioner is not to bother with the, the, the basic, the raw feelings, the basic feelings, so the basic physiological reaction, but to say to myself, wait, I'm getting upset about this thing. Is it appropriate for me to get upset? And especially, what am I going to do about it? Should I act on this thing or not? Right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. So 
Um, and also like you can um, experience these emotions as long as they don't have uh, cognitive components to them. Uh, one of the examples that was brought up in the ancient world and that Margaret Graver brings uh, to the fore in her book is uh, the example of crying to beautiful wordless music. Um, like that's not a passion. You could be in tears, but it's not a passion because it has no cognitive component. You're not like the world is good or bad or some part of the world is good or bad. It's just a beautiful piece of music. Um, so that's right. not that's not a judgment. Whereas um, and so, the, yeah, so that's kind of what separates them. Yeah, that's actually important because uh, another thing that I hear often is this precisely, this, oh, but they have nothing to say about like music, for instance, or, or, well, they don't because it's not a cognitive thing. And therefore, yeah, it's part of the human experience, but it's not the kind of thing that you want to worry about in terms of practicing, practicing or, you know, uh, becoming a more virtuous person. If you enjoy the piece of music and makes you cry, mm -hmm. go for it. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't make you a better person or a worse person. It just is, right? Um, yep. Now, I think that's still yeah, an arguable sorry, part of. Sto I think that is still an arguable part of Stoicism, whether the, the, uh, they focus more on the rational and pro-social nature, but whether transcendent experiences are needed to make a full human being, uh, as Jules Evans sometimes uh, talks about. Right. But that, that's a that's a separate issue. But that's a different. That's right. That is a separate issue. Um, now you mentioned several times, uh, Michael Graver. By the way, we're going to be getting to the questions, the Q and A in a few minutes. So if you if you have a question, just start raising your hand now. I see just one right now already. So you mentioned Michael uh, Graver uh, several times. She wrote this book on stoicism and emotion, which I think is the reference book at this point uh, uh, on, on the topic. Um, one of the things that, that um, uh, I liked about that book is the chapter on what she calls the pathetic syllogism, which you actually kind of hinted at before when you earlier, when you said, you, when you mentioned Chrysippus and how to deal with people that don't actually accept the stoic system. You, do you want to explain what the pathetic syllogism is? Yeah, so um, it's kind of what goes on kind of subconsciously that brings uh, pathé or passions or the subset of emotions that we're discussing to the fore. Um, and so you actually think have a different version than what I had in my notes um, for this t pathetic syllogism, but um, I'll give uh, the version that I have and people can look at sure. your blog post uh, for um, uh, the other version. Uh, so it's a, a syllogism is essentially a logical argument that consists of two premises and a conclusion. And so um, the things that bring passions or emotions to the fore are um, the two premises are objects of type T are good or perhaps evil. So you have a fundamental belief that some objects or events out there in the world are good or bad. Um, and that's the premise one. Um, and then the second part is if a good is present, it's appropriate for me to elevate my psyche. In other words, for me to feel a certain way about it, to have the have your soul flutter in a certain way in ancient Stoic terms, but to just feel a certain way in modern terms. Um, and then the uh, final um, premise is that object O being of type T is present, therefore it's appropriate for me to elevate my psyche. So. Um, Essentially, that's kind of doing two steps. First of all, it's saying it's giving you a factual impression that this thing is good or bad. The second thing is that it's appropriate. So this is a hormetic impression. Um, it's appropriate for me to feel a certain way about something. And then you could combine those together in order to ultimately get the passion. Um, and so this is what the Stoics kind of suggest um, how passions arise, though I don't want to. I don't want to go against Margaret Graver because that's a fight I'll probably lose. But the the <laughs> only the only source the source she leans on for this it's appropriate to elevate my psyche portion is uh, Cicero's um, uh, Tusculan Disputations, and that's the only place I think it's seen. In other places, uh, other sources seem to suggest that impressions, if you assent to them directly, elevate your psyche, and you don't have to presume this. But there, so there's a little bit of unclarity about the specifics. But that's the gist of it: that you have to essentially agree to two things in order to feel a passion. First of all, that something in front of you is good or bad, and secondly, that it's appropriate to feel a certain way about it. Right. Um, so the. Uh, the reason I brought up your, your earlier example with, with Chrysippus is because apparently Chrysippus and Cleanthes had two different approaches about ch challenging the, uh, the uh, pathetic syllogism, and one of which is more appropriate for people who actually accept the Stoic system, and the other one is more appropriate for to lay people, right? And so, as you pointed out, a syllogism is made of uh, you know a certain number of premises, and so if you want to avoid the conclusion, um, you know you have to show obviously either that 
the syllogism itself is badly constructed, it's not, it does, that, so that the conclusion doesn't actually logically follow. But assuming that it is, then your other, the, the other option is to challenge one or more of the premises, right? And so um, the premise that you might challenge if uh, with somebody who does uh, accept the Stoic system or is trying to practice Stoicism is the one that says, you know, there's something good or bad in front of you. And the reason that challenge is going to be successful with a Stoic petition is because the Stoic petition will immediately say, oh, that's right. The only thing that I actually good or bad are my own character. Uh, and so anything that is external, it doesn't fall into that category. At best, it's a preferred that is preferred and different. Therefore, that's it. Uh, the pathetic syllogism is successfully challenged. But if you don't accept that, which you know, a lot of people obviously don't, um, then you can accept the second premise. Uh, sorry, you can reject the second premise, which is, well, but is it appropriate for you to actually feel this way? So let's assume even that, okay, you believe that whatever happened to you, it's really, it's a bad thing. Um, fine, but is it appropriate for you to react, react that way right now? And there you might make inroads with people who don't necessarily accept stoicism, but they might say, oh yeah, you're right. That's, that's not the best way to react to, to, given the situation, even though I do think this is a catastrophe or I do think this is a bad thing, but nevertheless, uh, my reaction might not be the best uh, or it might be not the, the, the most appropriate time to have that kind of reaction, right? Um, right, and so also yeah. this, is, this is also useful for practicing Stoics because if a practicing Stoic's in a passion, they cannot really convince themselves of the that these things are not necessarily good or bad. Um, and so, if you're in a passion, the best thing to do is essentially step away from it. Um, so that's uh, indirectly challenging too. You're recognizing it's inappropriate, and you're just going to go away for a while and come back to it later. Right. Now, I have a couple of other points that I wanted to bring up, but uh, I don't want to run out of time. So let me start by taking some of the questions. Um, and then if we have more time, we'll go back to what, uh, what else I wanted to bring up. So Joseph is next. I'm going to unmute you or it's first, I should say. Hi. Go for uh, it. Hi, guys. Uh, thank you so much for hosting today and uh, for following your handbook for Stoics uh, in our Stoics group. And it's been tremendously helpful. So thank you for that. Um, I'm just walking through and I really am having problems to come up with a, you know, uh, uh, a good emotion. So one of the <laughs> things that I was thinking about, though, was let's just say you have a triggering moment that leads to an emotional response that's irrational, but it also leads to a certain amount of creativity that you wouldn't otherwise have been able to achieve because of this irrational action and it, and is that a form of a good emotion because it may not have been rational you may not have been functioning within your control but it led to an insight a design insight that you would another otherwise have had okay thank you uh, uh greg uh well the, i guess the question is are, are design insights good or bad are they what make a human life uh honest according to stoicism uh, no um so I guess I would probably lean towards saying like, yeah, even in that case, I mean, uh, presuming it's actually a passion because there are plenty of things that we could point to and say like, th maybe that they feel a certain way, but they're not necessarily a passion. So we'd have to like suss out the specifics, but I would caution against like saying, yeah, it, le it led to um, a certain outcome. Is that outcome good or bad? Not according to Stoic philosophy. Therefore, it's not desirable. So it's not a good. Right. It may be preferable, maybe selectable, right? But not, it's not a good. Sure, but then a passion, which is a bad, got um, right. produced a exactly. preferred and different. And so that is uh, yeah. not. Yeah. That, that's problematic, that's yeah. right. Um, okay, M. Johnson is next. You can unmute yourself, I think. Hi, can yeah. you hear me? Go ahead. Yes, good. we can hear you. First of all, I really enjoy these sessions. So thank you all for organizing them. Um, I was very excited when I read that you were going to distinguish clearly between emotions and feelings, but I'm afraid to me, I didn't see a clear, it was, it, it fluctuated all over the place. Now there are many, many points I disagree with you on. Um, and it seems if you are stoicism accurately, then with stoicism, um, uh, but I can't, I haven't got time to go into those. So I'll just make a very simple statement of alternative view. In three lines, okay? Feelings okay. are our reasons. Emotions do interfere with reasoning, but reasoning serves feelings. In other words, it's reorganizing the objective world according to a desired feeling. 
And if you want to know where this comes from, it comes from Marx Capital, Volume 1, a very small piece, and I think about Chapter 9. Um, and it's basically dialectics. Um, it's a very different position from Stoicism. I get the sense overall, although I can't argue every point with you, that this is a rather over male, yin yang type of, like most religions are. It over favors reason um, when in fact I would say that feeling, or what Marx calls it, imagination, is more primary to human. That we start with imagination, we start with feeling. That's not emotion. Emotion. Feelings don't have objects. Emotions do. That's right. the way right. to distinguish between the two. Okay. That's okay. It. Okay. Thank. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, so, Greg, I want to hear, of course, what you have to say. I, I want to make a couple of points, however, before um, you, you address the question uh, or the point or the comment. Uh, one, if I I didn't realize this this uh, notion came from or was also found in Marx, but it sounds to me that that's a human approach as well. That's David Hume. Um, uh, 18th century British uh, sort of Scottish philosopher uh, who famously said, among other things, you know, reason is and ought to be the slave of passions. And, and he knew exactly what he was talking. He used his, his words carefully because he actually was very um, aware of the Stoic tradition. He wrote a, a, a nice essay on Stoicism. And so basically his point was, look, it's, it's the passions that motivate us to, to, uh, to act, uh, not reason. Reason just is it's only instrumental, which is the point, I think, that um, was just was just made. Um, that said, I, I, I also think feel it's a little strange to talk about uh, to say that most religions uh, uh, favor uh, reason over feelings. I mean, that's I my impression with religions is exactly the opposite, as it turns out. Um, and also, stoicism is not a religion. So, but yes, if the point is stoicism definitely emphasizes the role of reason. No question about it. Um, uh, Greg, what, what do you think? Well, I mean, I can see where you're coming from to some degree, and yeah, it is Humean, but I mean, I have to ask the question, how do you know that um, emotions uh, influence uh, reason and that they get in the way of reasoning? Did you imagine that to use your own terms or did you reason through it? If you imagined it, then maybe other people can imagine differently and that's the end of that. But if you could reason, hopefully we're at least triangulating on something close to an objective truth. Um, so it seems like a mildly self-defeating view. I mean, let's imagine all sorts of things in that case. Um, and also, if you don't like the reasonable argument, I could also appeal to the passions. That's a depressing <laughs> point of view too. Um, you know, that essentially means the marketers win. When, they, when somebody can pluck your heartstring in the right way, you dance like a puppet. You are essentially um, giving in to other people's whims. Is that the kind of world you want to live in? I'll leave that for you to decide. Right. However, there is one way in which there is a point to be made there, in, a small point, I think, but in favor of, of a human uh, view, uh, of a partial human view, even from a stoic perspective, I think. Um, and that is, I think that it is, the, the Stoics, as you know, do have these, these developmental theory of, of virtue where they say that human beings start out naturally pro-social, right? So first of all, the first thing that we naturally care about is ourselves and our preservation and so on. And then very, when we're very young, we immediately realize that that actually does depend on the welfare of the people that surround us. And so that we become, we, we take the first steps to, toward pro-sociality. All of that is before the age of reason. And it's, it's kind of a natural instinct. From a biological perspective, a modern biological perspective, I would say that just means that human beings as a, a species of primates who are highly social comes endowed with you know, uh, instinct, pro-social instincts. Uh, and then the Stoic would say, and did say, uh, but then when, when the age of reason comes, then you start really working on this stuff and bringing it to the next level. And that's where you, re you start getting into these more and more expanding circles of concerns up, up until the point in which uh, you're, you're supposed to be concerning yourself with the entire uh, human race and not just with your friends and, and relatives, right? So I could say, I could see that um, if somebody were lacking pro-social instincts, which are natural to human beings, that person probably would be a psychopath. Okay? That, for that person, probably you would have, the reason would be just instrumental to do whatever he wanted and it couldn't bring him um, you know, to do the right thing. But I think that's a defective human being. If you're talking about the natural range of sort of, of humanity, I think the Stoics pretty much got it right that you, you, we do have an instinct 
uh, although they didn't use that term. But we do have an instinct toward prosociality. And then, however, it's reason that really refines that instinct, that really applies it in a consistent, systematic way. And that's the point where uh, your response comes in and says, you know, because if you don't do that, then you're in the in the thralls of anybody who can manipulate your emotions and you become a puppet. Does that make sense to you? Uh, yeah, I, I, th I think it does. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, then, great. That was easy. Uh, uh, Tim is next. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, so you might have already mentioned this uh, with your personality, but I was wondering if you could speak a bit on the justification the stoic justification for compassion or justice, like if feelings don't matter, why should we help to ease others' suffering or help to you know, reduce suffering in others? Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Greg, I think we actually literally just kind of addressed this, but Greg, do you have anything else to add? Uh, I, I mean, yeah, it's part of, uh, humans tend to do better when they work together. Um, it's part of human nature at the end of the day to kind of, try to help each other out. Plus, we, m many people, but not all people, have, um, have a natural impulse to do this. And the ones who do it, I wouldn't quite use Massimo's terms from before, that they're defective, because that's a little too normative. I think Larry Becker addresses this, where it's kind of like, we could put the normative stuff to the side to say most people are like this. And so Stoics are describing most people, no norms needed. And there are people who fall outside of the norms. And so you deal with them in different ways. Um, so uh, yeah, but I mean, uh, most people do kind of have some sort of drive to help other people out and have social um, urges. So I would kind of say that that's the basics of it. Yeah, that's right. But again, the, the, the notion here, the difference between this position and this human position is that Hume famously said that reason is only instrumental and that's all. Uh, in, in the stoic uh, uh, framework, on the other hand, reason becomes to you know, eventually uh, channels your emotional responses in the right direction. You realize that, no, it's not okay for me to get angry at this particular person for this particular thing. And therefore I need to work on this and not do it. Or it's not right for me to respond in this way, even though it comes natural to me. And so I'm going to veto my own response to that and so on and so forth, right? So, so reason isn't just something that you use instrumentally in a Machiavellian fashion, so to speak. Uh, you, you know, you use it to construct, to, to move in a certain direction. Um, Alex is next. Great, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks Massimo. Uh, thanks Greg for uh, your talk. Um, I have a question, um, I guess coming from um, what may be an Epicurean or like a psychoanalytic perspective, um, what would you say to somebody who says that Stoicism is setting up uh, its practitioners for mental illness. Um, <laughs> and in the following way, uh, so in psychoanalysis, you have this idea that emotions need to be expressed in order uh, for mental health to be achieved, right? So there is this method of catharsis that um, you know a person sits down with a therapist and uh, the goal is to let suppressed emotions kind of come up. And that's supposed to, you know, clear, uh, essentially bring a person to mental health. And how would the Stoics respond to this? I know also Aristotle talks about catharsis in his, um, uh, in his poetics, and it's kind of a similar, there's a similar, um, you know, idea behind it. Great, thank you. Greg? Uh, so in short, the, this kind of relies on what I think is sometimes called the hydraulic theory of emotions, that emotions are things that are get built up and so need to be released before the pressure gets too great. Um, the literature in terms of anger is pretty unequivocal on this and says that if you practice anger, you'll just get more angry. Um, it's, uh, I've actually looked for the, through the psychological literature for other emotions and I haven't found as much, but at least for anger, you know, you tend to become what you practice more. And if you're practicing uh, passions over and over of various sorts, um, it's likely that you're going to just get better at being more and more passionate. Um, but this is an empirical claim at the end of the day. And it's one of the ways in which stoicism could be put up to empirical challenge um, because they do have a theory that these passions repeatedly become infirmaries and illnesses, which are kind of technical terms that grave rack actually goes into later on in her book um, about, and about how these things build up with time and become um, kind of mental habits that make people worse off. 
Yeah. Well, so that brings me actually to one point that I wanted to raise earlier, which is, you know, what do we know today about this old stuff? Because after all, uh, if we're talking about stoic ethics, you know, ethics is in fact normative, you know, it tells you, you should think this about things in a certain way. So ethics is something you can take or live, you know, it either makes sense, it's coherent or not, and either it's useful or not. But if we're talking about psychology or if we're talking about the theory of emotions and so on and so forth, then we're talking science. Uh, and therefore this, as you just said, becomes an empirical question. Well, does the, the, the stoic model actually hold up to scrutiny or, or not? And if it does, great. Um, if it doesn't, then we, we need to modify it to, to, to accordingly, right? That's, that's one of the reasons, of course, the Stoics themselves insisted that we should study three uh, fields of inquiry, right? The ethics, the physics, what they call the physics, that is natural science, and, um, and, and the, the logic, uh, because they, they kind of go together. The ethics is the point. You want to live a good life, a life worth living, but you can't do that if you misunderstand how the world works, or if you don't reason correctly about how the world works. So whenever, when I looked, um, you know, recently at the um, current treatment of emotions in cognitive science, it does seem like the Stoics had a right, the right intuition. Obviously, when they were talking about a cognitive component of it, um, obviously it you know it it would be completely anachronistic to say that that the Stoics were psychologists in the modern sense of the term. Uh, that's just nonsense. They had a, some, some, you know, intuition about how the human mind actually works. Um, and it's interesting for us to compare those intuitions to the scientific image that comes out of, from, from today. So one of the things I read uh, recently pointed out that, for instance, there is an interesting distinction in uh, uh, neuroscience and, and psychology when people use sometimes even the same term for, the, for, a, for a particular emotion. Let's take fear, for instance. So often, uh, from a neuroscientific perspective, from neuro neurological perspective, fear is actually the, the uh, physiological, the feeling that you get because of your physiological reaction, the rush of adrenaline, that sort of stuff. But that is not what psychology is referred to as an emotion. The emotion of fear in psychology is actually, does in fact have a cognitive component, and it is something on the lines of, oh, I ought to be afraid of this thing because this is happening and this is dangerous for me and this is not a good thing, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the two things go together um, one of my because typically the physiological reaction generates some kind of explanation you know cognitive cognitive uh, assessment of what's going on uh, and uh, and sometimes the cognitive assessment can actually feed back into the the feeling the, the raw feeling the physiological feeling and sort of calm it down one of my favorite examples is this article that I read uh, I think last year of this woman that was on a date and um and she didn't feel like the, the 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 date was going particularly well it was okay it was like eh. um and then she started feeling these butterflies of the stomach and and it was the same feeling the same sensation that she had when she eventually really went for the guy and then uh, like it was it was something that was clicking and so she she thought she'd remember in, her, in the article she said i remember thinking to myself maybe i should pay more attention maybe this thing is going better than i thought you know paying attention to my gut feelings and then she rushed to the uh to the bathroom and um and vomited because she had uh, uh, food poison which happened to give a similar physiological reaction to the butterfly to the stomach to me that's a great example of the distinction between the physiological reaction the sort of the rough what i'm calling the raw feeling and the cognitive emotion. And it's also a good example of how one can A, misinterpret the, uh, the raw feeling. It's like, oh, I must be falling in love because this is what happened before when I had this feeling. Uh, but at the same time, also correct the, uh, the, 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 the initial assessment. And now actually this was food poisoning as it turns out. So I better terminate the date and go home this, and, and do something else with, with my time. Uh, right, so does that make sense to you, uh, Greg? Yeah, yeah, it, it does. Um... Uh, yeah, there's, as far as how stoicism relates to modern science, I'm not like totally clear on modern neuroscience. I'm not sure though. Like I know I'm somewhat familiar with Damasio's work and like there yeah. seems to be a little bit of a rub there. Like what he calls emotions actually like a pattern of physiological and behavioral responses that occur automatically. It's kind of like a program. Um, and I'm not sure where he would put necessarily the hegemonicon, but it's a lot of work. And I think like stoicism probably needs, like that's an interesting research project for masters and graduate students if they want to take a look at it and yeah. kind of tease out like how whether sto the concepts of stoicism can reasonably be mapped onto what we know about modern uh, neurology. 
Sounds good. And uh, we got to the end of the hour. So uh, I'm going to thank you again for uh, coming on the, the, the show today. Uh, this, was, this was a lot of fun and I hope that people have uh, enjoyed it and learned something. Uh, and I'm also going to remind uh, people that the next show is going to be on Monday, June 29th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, my guest is going to be Don Robertson, and we're going to talk about his latest book, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, uh, that Roman emperor, of course, being Mark Cerullius. All right. Uh, thanks to everybody. <laughs> Stay safe. I, was hoping, I was hoping it was Caligula, but <laughs> and, uh, I'm no. sorry. Next time. <laughs> All right, everybody. Have a good one. Bye-bye.